Hello and welcome to this very brief presentation related to an overview of dampers and damping. Damping is a characteristic of a mechanical system, often due to friction effects, which cause a loss of energy in the system. This in turn causes a reduction in the amplitude of the vibrations in an elastic system or of the oscillations of a rigid body. A damper, also known as a dashpot, diagrammatically shown here in the sketch, is a device that uses viscous friction, that's friction generated due to shearing of a fluid, to resist motion. And this then reduces vibrations or oscillations over a period of time. The viscous friction in the damper creates a damping force that's proportional to the velocity. In other words, the greater the velocity, the greater the damping force. So in our sketch on the right hand side, we have an applied force F to the dash pot that generates a velocity in the dash pot, which is related to the damping force generated by the dash pot. Notice that the damping force acts in the opposite direction to the velocity. It's shown on our diagram here. Let's consider the damper. Figure one, shown here, shows a cross section through a simple damper, which consists of a piston, shown here, contained within a cylinder, it's a cylinder wall shown here. The damper continued. The piston is free to travel in the cylinder, but in order to do so, fluid, shown here that fills the cylinder, which is usually oil, must flow through the hole in the piston. Hole in the piston shown here. Thus only a small force is required to expand the piston if it's moved slowly, but a large force is required to expand the piston if it's moved quickly. The damping force, denoted as FD, it's required to expand the damper with velocity v. If fd is equal to c multiplied by v, where c is a constant known as the damping coefficient. Let's consider the SI unit of damping coefficient. As always, when using the SI system, the unit is derived from the formula. So noting that FD is equal to C multiplied by V, I transpose the equation here, C is equal to FD divided by V. We know that FD, force is in newtons, and velocity is in meters per second. So thus the SI unit of coefficient C is the newton per meter per second. Also written as newton multiplied by in brackets, meters per second to the negative one. Alternatively, C could be written as newton seconds divided by meters. That relates to our division of fractions, how we turn the denominator upside down and multiply. And that could also be written as newton second meters to negative one. Furthermore, if we note that the newton is actually the kilogram meter per second squared in SI base units, then C can be written as kilogram meters second divided by second squared meters. In other words, we're replacing the Newton here with the kilogram meter per second squared here. Notice we can cancel the meter in the numerator with the meter in denominator and also the second in the numerator cancel with the squared on the second in the denominator. So that simplifies to kilogram per second. So another unit for C is kilogram per second, or of course that could be written as kilogram second to the negative one. So there are various units that can be used for damping coefficient C. Here's a brief summary of the SI units for damping coefficient. The newton per meter per second, the newton second per meter, or the kilogram per second. Any of those units are valid to use for damping coefficient C.
Let's briefly review some of the basic assumptions made when modelling a damper. One, an assumption behind the linear model of our damper is that the piston is free to travel. Of course, this assumption is invalid when the piston strikes the end of the cylinder. Two, the damping force, denoted FD, is considered to be proportional to the velocity V of the piston. So damping force FD, shown here, is proportional to the linear velocity, shown here. The proportionality constant, in this case, is the damping coefficient C. So the damping force equation, FD, is equal to C multiplied by V. Assumptions continued. 3. To simplify the relationship between damping force and velocity, it's convenient to assume that the damper is an idealised component. In other words, the damper has negligible mass. In practice, this is a valid assumption as the damping effect is usually dominant. Note for reference, a similar assumption is made in our previous presentation when analysing a spring when deriving its relationship between spring force Fs and extension X. To assume the mass of the spring was negligible, we find that force is proportional to extension, and that's known as spring stiffness. There's a separate presentation related to springs and spring stiffness. Here's a practical example of a damper. So a common example of a practical damper is a car shock absorber, shown in figure 3, here. Shock absorbers absorb the energy stored in a spring. The coil spring is shown here in figure 3. And thus the spring, and in this case the car, is unable to bounce, in other words to oscillate. When a spring extends or compresses, its movement is dampened by the piston sliding inside the shock absorber's oil-filled cylinder. Here's the oil inside the cylinder. The oil has to flow through very small channels in the piston, thus the piston is restricted to move only slowly through the oil. Let's consider damper operation. So a force F is applied to a piston sliding within a fluid filled cylinder where the fluid is often oil, which is incompressible. Oil is forced through very small holes. These sometimes are called channels or restrictors in the piston. And this produces a resistance to the motion, absorbing energy and so inducing damping. For interest, a homemade version of a damper is a bicycle pump, shown in figure 4 here, with the air hole at the end partially covered. In figure 4, here's our piston, here's our cylinder, and at the end here is the air hole. Damper operation continued. So the bicycle pump provides an easy way of experimenting with the characteristics of a damper. Figure 5 here shows the hole at the end of the pump uncovered, so there's no resistance to the motion of the piston. And figure 6 shows the hole at the end of the pump partially covered, so now there is a resisting force to the motion. Just note for reference that Obviously, we're considering air here, and air is compressible, and that does actually complicate the characteristics of the bicycle pump. But the bicycle pump does conveniently illustrate, quite generically, the characteristics of a damper, in that the more that the hole at the end of the pump is covered, the greater the resistance to the movement or the velocity of the piston. Let's consider an illustration of damping coefficient. If the damping coefficient for a particular damper is stated as 5 newton seconds per meter, we're asked to 
calculate the force range if the velocity range is from negative 1 meter per second to 2 meters per second. We know that the damping force equation Fd is equal to C multiplied by V where C is the damping coefficient given in the question 5 newton seconds per meter and V is the velocity and that's in meters per second. So to calculate the upper damping force limit or the FDU here that's the damping coefficient multiplied by the upper velocity so in this case that's 5 newton seconds per meter multiplied by 2 meters per second. So the upper force in our range is 10 newtons and similarly the lower damping force FDL here is again C but this time multiplied by VL the lower velocity. So evaluating that's 5 multiplied by negative 1 so that's negative 5 newtons. So for the given range of velocity, we've now got the range of damping forces. Here's our damping coefficient illustration continued. So velocity plotted on the horizontal axis in meter per second, ranging from negative 1 to positive 2. And on the vertical axis, the associated damping force in newtons, ranging from negative 5 to 10 newtons. So figure 7 shown here is a graph of damping force Fd plotted against velocity V. Just note for reference that the negative force relates to a directional change of 180 degrees. So for our linear damper a positive force may be a movement from left to right and a negative force would relate to a movement from right to left. Notice also that the damping coefficient C is actually the gradient or the slope of the line here. Here's the bibliography used to help generate the presentation. And I hope this short presentation has been of interest to you. And thank you for viewing.